This video is a brief summary of the IL-17 pathway and the complexities of it. So in this cartoon, uh, basically what I'm showing here is a brief summary on the more well characterized or, or better characterized TH profiles or phenotypes that have been associated with diseases. Starting with TH1, this particular phenotype is very um, well characterized as an inflammatory uh, response. It is a response to danger and basically it's the response we typically will have when we get a sunburn or a cut or we uh, are dealing with most pathogens, bacteria, etc. So this is a, a profile that's characterized by the uh, phenotypic uh, specialization of the T helper cells into the Th1 and it's going to cause a very inflammatory response. The Th2 is a response that's very characteristic of allergies, allergic responses, and this is the way that the body has uh, to deal with different kinds of allergens, uh, anywhere from food allergies to eczema to, to uh, mosquito bites, and of course the diseases are very allergic. The Th17 profile is associated with the Th22 profile in humans and basically the diseases are have a component of inflammation but they have been very well characterized and it's typical, uh, very actively typical for psoriasis intestinal bowel disease or inflammatory bowel disease that comprises Crohn's disease and also tip colitis and rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. So these particular phenotypes are characterized uh, for the TH response and finally we lead with the tolerance or immunosuppressive profile of the T regulatory cells FOXP3. These are not linear, as I'm showing them here. They would be seemingly independent. But now we know that there's a lot of crosstalk and a lot of control and communication between these different uh, phenotypic expressions of uh, the different TH cells. And again, they can occur either in the normal situation dealing with danger or they can be associated with very specific diseases. So the Th1, one of the products of that Th1 differentiation is interferon gamma, which was also one of the triggers that made the pluripotent T cell differentiate into Th1. So there's a bit of a retro active loop that's positive, building up on that response. And this is something that we have all lived uh, through when we fall and have a trauma, when we cut ourselves, or dealing with diseases. In a first stage, there's an increase. There has to be an augmentation of that particular cell that is perfect for dealing with that particular response. In uh, a second stage, the products of this Th1 can also stimulate some of the cells that are characteristics of the Th2. In this case, particularly TNF has been shown to stimulate the B cells, which are very typically a response of the Th2. Now, interleukin-2 uh, is inhibiting the differentiation to Th17, and it's a major product of the Th1, but it also inhibits the B cell, the isotype switch. So in other words, you have TNF stimulating the B cells, but IL-2 from the Th1 profile inhibits the switch. So the most characteristic B cell response in Th1 inflammatory responses is not going to be switched. It's going to be either an IgM, like when we have the rheumatoid factors, or it can go to IgG, but you don't see the full switch of the B cell 
a heavy chain to an IgE, which is typical of the Th2 response. So in this sense, there's a combination of crosstalk and there is a specialization into what is going to happen for that particular profile. The Th2 profile also has this sort of retroactive loop that's providing a positive feedback into producing more Th2s. And of course, with all the allergies we do know that you know you start sneezing, you start itching, and originally there's a very fast increase in that particular Th2 response. The Th2s will produce interleukin-4, which were also the cytokine that differentiated the pluripotent T cells into Th2s. But also some of the products of the panet cells and epithelial cells that are the distal and organ target of the Th2 response will be producing some cytokines that will stimulate further Th2 development. So there's this retroactive loop of growth. And uh, there's also this crosstalk. The B cell is actually not only responding to interleukin-6, but it's also producing interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 can actually uh, have signaling effects on the inflammatory pathways not only, as you can see here in this cartoon, uh, having effect on synoviocytes, fibroblasts, and uh, even osteoclasts and cartilage. But if you go left in this cartoon, interleukin-6 also has effects on the differentiation of Th17s, Th22s, and Tregs. So the production of, of some of these interleukin-6 by the stimulated B cells can actually lead to also some stimulation of other pathways in this uh, TH phenotypic uh, differentiation. Likewise, uh, as all the other pathways, TH17s will produce interleukin-21, which is one of the cytokines that, that actually produces differentiation from the pluripotent cell into a Th17 cell. And interleukin-17, which is the major product of the Th17 profile, will inhibit the differentiation into Th1. So you can see right now here that generally a differentiation into Th1 inhibits via IL-2 a differentiation to Th17 and Th17 differentiation via directly into leukin-17 inhibits the differentiation into Th1. So there's a little bit of a control mechanism here that would probably tell us that diseases will have either one or another phenotypic profile which would be more typical of a particular uh, disease stage or even individuals. So not all diseases are going to be the same uh, during the, uh, the uh, disease progress and also in different patients. Interleukin-17 uh, also inhibits directly NK cells, which are uh, a major target of Th1 responses. Now, what we see then is that almost all of the products of all of the other differentiations, either peripherally from neutrophils or even from the first TH phenotypic responses, the production of TNF can come from many different places. Interleukin-6, as I mentioned, also can be produced in different stages and different phenotypic expressions, and interleukin-2 together with interleukin-27, will eventually lead to a tolerance or immunosuppressive profile typical of the T regulatory cell. So all of these is actually characterized, but the important factor for this particular uh, image is to say, how do we know it's a Th1 or a Th17? It's the cytokine profile. So the cytokine profile not only drives the differentiation uh, on, the, on the very left, the first column of interleukins listed in their cytokines, uh, not only the cytokine, the specific cytokine profile, it will determine 
what is going to be the differentiation, either Th1, Th2, Th17, 22, or Treg, but also each one of these will be characterized by the secretion and production of a very specific cytokine profile that helps identify what is the response we are seeing. So that's why it is very important to understand cytokine pathways and Th phenotypic profiles in uh, the concept of the diseases that they're associated with, but also how they deal with danger. Because when trying to modulate these, if we understand what they're there for, we have to remember the immune system is not there for to, to cause diseases. It's there to deal with danger. So if a particular disease has a predominant pathway, we need to also remember what is that pathway normally used for and what could be the potential adverse event profile expected if I modulate that pathway. How is it that cytokines signal and create this uh, complex system of communicating between cells? So what I have put in here is a, a generic cell that has receptors. These receptors could be receptors to soluble ligands or cytokines, or they could be receptors for homing or uh, co-stimulatory factors. So whatever the receptor is on the cell, these receptors have the characteristics of having three domains. The extracellular domain is the one that will be specifically, uh, the anatomy of it is going to be specific for binding the corresponding ligand. The transmembrane domain is the anchor, is the one that allows this uh, particular protein, uh, the receptors, to not leave the cell or not go into the cell. But it's the anchor that allows having one domain outside, the extracellular domain. And then the intracellular domain, uh, that is the one that will produce the signal. The intracellular domain is the, is the one that it's actually bringing the message into the cell of what it has to do in response to what happened outside. So the cytokine is knocking at the door, but it doesn't come in into the house. It just brings a letter. It just brings a message into the cell, and then the cell interprets that message. So it's the extracellular domain, which I call it more the anatomical domain, then there's the anchor domain, transmembrane, and the intracellular domain, which I call the functional domain. Now, the way that they work when I put this in, a, in an augmentation figure is basically uh, we have the receptors on the surface. Like I said, they're anchored, so there's a piece that's outside extracellular, a piece that's inside. And inside the cytoplasm, we have different kinds of kinases, which are basically enzymes that are going to allow a particular chemical reaction to occur by bringing energy um, through the system. Basically, it's going to be phosphorus, but there's other kinases that um, and, and other ways, but basically it's phosphorus that will produce the energy to uh, create that chemical reaction inside. And there's different kinds of secondary messengers. So what happens is that when the receptors are uh, engaged by the corresponding soluble factors, what uh, the reaction is that the kinases will be activated basically, like I said, by phosphorylation, and they then in turn activate the secondary messengers, which are now internal in the cytoplasm. Eventually, they get to the nucleus of the cell. And the ultimate thing is gene transcription.
So if we look at the example that uh, I had before, you have, for instance, the uh, interleukin-23 that will be engaging the receptor and it will be phosphorylating internally to produce a gene transcription that's the production of interleukin-17. That's one example. So IL-23 is uh, one of the TH17 cytokines and what basically happens is the engagement through this receptor system will produce this T cell into starting to secrete interleukin-17 and actually differentiate into a TH17 cell. So we can actually use either small molecules or biologics, which are more popular for this particular interaction. We can use them to block that binding or the engagement with the receptor. And the way that we can block this is either by blocking the soluble protein or blocking the receptor. So there's different ways that this interaction can be tampered with. And the whole idea is that by not allowing that engagement, uh, what we have now is lack of activation and no gene transcription. So the particular cytokine that we may be blocking is still circulating. Cells may still be producing it, but uh, it cannot uh, engage with cells, and so it's rendered uh, futile. It doesn't actually have an effect on the cells because we've blocked it. And this is the way that many of these uh, extracellular drugs have been used, developed and used successfully to treat different diseases. In this cartoon, I have actually depicted a hypothetical cell uh, just to show how the many different receptors can have intracellular signaling mechanisms. In the case of the interleukin-17, this particular receptor has three chains and it will actually communicate internally using different superfamily secondary messengers. It does use the NF-kappa B signaling cascade. It also will use the PI3K cascade and the MAP kinase cascade. It's a very complicated intracellular mechanism for the different signaling and it is not a, a separate superfamily. This particular receptor uses different superfamily signalings intracellularly. The complexity of the intracellular communication is uh, another signal of how important this signaling is. Uh, we do use the interleukin-17 in, in, uh, in response to several different infections, especially fungal infections, candidiasis, etc. And it is one of the pathways that it's triggered by the toll-like receptor activation. So in the interleukin-17 receptor, we have different receptors and we have actually different kinds of interleukin-17. It's a family of interleukins. But interleukin A and F, which have been better characterized because of their prominent um, activity uh, in psoriasis, in psoriatic arthritis, and in, test in an inflammatory bowel disease, uh, these particular two cytokines bind the same receptor. And this receptor will signal through many different internal kinase activation pathways, as mentioned. This is one of the reasons why blocking interleukin-17 with a biologic that works extracellularly can immediately inhibit all of these different cascade of events and ultimately inhibit the signal transduction that IL-17 produces, causing 
different inflammatory cytokines and also some interesting stabilization of chemokine mess messenger RNA. Uh, IL-17 is used for a lot of different pathways and it's a very interesting cytokine family and TH phenotype. So again, uh, it is very good using it externally with a biologic that blocks the extracellular binding of the cytokine, there's no more engagement with the receptor, there will be no phosphorylation and no activation. In this cartoon, what I have shown here is a typical uh, TH pluripotent cell and what would be the different pathways that have to do with the TH17 differentiation. In other words, what makes this particular T cell start producing IL-17? So what we see is that interleukin-27 and interferon gamma will signal through the STAT1 activation and that inhibits directly STAT3. So STAT3 is the activation uh, factor that directly will produce a gene transduction into an IL-17 secretion. So the STAT1 activation via the IL-27 and interferon gamma inhibits STAT3 and also not only directly but through the TBET secondary messengers. Interleukin-4 through the STAT6 activation inhibits the phosphorylation of STAT3. Interleukin-2 through the STAT5 will inhibit the activation of STAT3, and interleukin-12 through the STAT4 activation will inhibit STAT3. So all of these pathways, what they're doing is basically inhibiting a TH17 differentiation. So starting from the left, interleukin-27 is associated with a phenotype that is a TH regulatory cell. Interleukin-4 is the major trigger for Th2 differentiation. So while it's promoting Th2 phenotype, it's inhibiting the Th17 phenotype by inhibiting STAT3. Interleukin-2 is one of the major products of uh, the Th1 phenotypic expression, and it will inhibit the Th17 phenotype and interleukin-12 is actually one of the major drivers for the differentiation into Th1. So differentiation into Th1 or Th2 or T regulatory cells will be done through this activation of the JAK-STAT pathways that not only stimulate their corresponding Th phenotypic expression, but all, all of them at the same time as phosphorylating their respective stats are going to be inhibiting the STAT3 that is associated with the TH17 phenotype. So this is one mechanism by which a TH17 will be uh, inhibited from phenotypic differentiation. These are the ones that inhibit the TH17 pathway. Interleukin-23 uh, will directly phosphorylate STAT3 as well as interleukin-21 and interleukin-6. So they will directly signal through the JAK-STAT pathway, phosphorylate the STAT3, and there's two different effects. One of them through the ROR gamma, intranuclear uh, transcription factor, it will directly stimulate the synthesis of interleukin-17. So th these pathways are going to promote a TH17 phenotype. STAT3 can directly bind the nucleus, you know, the gene <coughs> transcription, and through the NFAT transcriptor fa factors will also stimulate IL-17 synthesis. But in addition, it also stimulates the, the genetic uh, expression and transcription of the uh, interleukin-21, which is one of the major uh, factors that stimulates Th17, as you can see at the top. So it's a product, but it's also a stimulation of the STAT3. And it's a, a big promoter of Th17 differentiation. Uh, in addition, they also, uh, through the STAT3 phosphorylation, will increase the expression of the IL-23 receptor, again, uh, 
augmenting the response to IL-23 into a TH17 differentiation. The TGF beta receptor through this MADS seems to have also a positive effect on interleukin 17 production. And finally, the T cell receptor through NFAT directly goes into the nucleus and stimulates IL 17. These are basically the pathways that will promote a TH17 differentiation. Uh, when we're looking at diseases that could be mediated by TH17, we need to understand that what we need to do is to decrease the uh, TH17 phenotype. One of the oldest treatments available in psoriasis was retinoid acid. And now we understand that through the receptor of retinoid acid, it actually will inhibit the ROR gamma phosphorylation. So it does inhibit the production of IL-17 and hence uh, it has efficacy in treating uh, psoriasis, for instance. Now, in addition of cytokines uh, mediating through the STAT1 and STAT5, the inhibition of STAT3, these particular STAT phosphorylations will also go directly into a FOXP3 gene stimulation of these T regulatory cells. So not only the IL-27 inhibits differentiation directly by inhibiting STAT3 of TH17 uh, cells, but it also directly will stimulate this, the differentiation into a T regulatory cell that carries a FOXP3 gene. Likewise, also the interleukin-2 is not only directly inhibiting STAT3 via the STAT5, but it also will produce a phenotype that is a T regulatory cell and not the TH17 cell. So there's a lot of different pathways associated with the TH17 uh, phenotype. And even though interleukin-17 does not signal through the CHAK-STAT pathways, the production of IL-17 is dependent on the JAK-STAT pathways. To create this uh, particular file and uh, the animations and the cartoons, I have uh, consulted many different uh, literature reviews and different papers, but these are the ones that I would highly recommend, and I will put them in the YouTube description. Thank you for listening.